Thanks for joining us and welcome to our Campus Conversations, a webinar series hosted by the Consortium of Universities of the Washington Metropolitan Area. I am Wayne Frederick, the president of Howard University. Howard is one of the 18 colleges and universities across the national capital region that make up the members of the consortium. As the board chair of the organization, I meet regularly with the, my fellow presidents in the area to discuss key issues affecting our communities. We all know that many individuals have serious and reasonable questions and concerns about the COVID vaccines. It is also clear that misinformation, both unintentional and purposeful, is proliferating, especially through social media. So in response, the consortium is hosting these panels in hopes of providing you with direct access to unbiased experts from across our institutions. And so we welcome your questions today. You may submit them. Uh, please use the Q&A button. There's also closed captioning available. And I'm certainly grateful to be joined uh, by some esteemed um, colleagues who I'll introduce, give you some short bios, and then we'll jump right in. First, uh, Dr. Vanessa Northington Gamble. She's University Professor of Medical Humanities and Professor of Health Policy and American Studies at the George Washington University. She's the first woman in African American to hold this prestigious endowed faculty position. She's also Professor of Health Policy in the Milken Institute at the School of Public Health, Professor of American Studies in the Columbian College of Arts and Sciences, and an adjunct professor of nursing at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. Throughout her career, she has worked to promote equity and justice in medicine and public health. She chaired the committee that took the lead role in getting the 1997 apology from President Clinton for the United States Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee. She's also an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. A uh, physician, scholar, and activist, Dr. Gamble is an internationally recognized expert on the history of American medicine, racial ethnic disparities in health and healthcare, public health ethics and bioethics. And she's the author of several widely acclaimed publications on the history of race and racism in American medicine and bioethics. A proud native of West Philadelphia, Dr. Gamble received her BA from Hampshire College and her MD and PhD in the history and sociology of science from the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Jim Owls is University Professor of Neuroscience and Public Policy at George Mason, Mason University. He served from 2014 to 2018 as head of the Biological Sciences Directorate at the US National Science Foundation, NSF, responsible for an annual budget of over 750 million. Ohl's former directorate funds the majority of non-biomedical research at America's research institutions. And while there, he was also NSF le NSF's lead for President Obama's White House Brain Project, deputy lead for NSF on Vice President Biden's cancer moonshot and co-chair the White House Life Sciences Subcommittee of the National Science and Technology Council. Prior to his time at NSF, Oz was the director of George Mason University's Krasnow Institute for Advanced Study and chair of the Molecular Science Department and the Shelley Krasnow University Professor of Molecular Neuroscience. Oz received his PhD in Neuroscience from the University of Michigan and his BA in Chemistry from Amherst College. Dr. Sharida Hill Goldman is the Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer for Johns Hopkins Medicine. Dr. Golden formerly served as the Executive Vice Chair for the Department of Medicine and has had a successful career as a physician scientist focused on diabetes epidemiology, health services research, and, and disparities. She is the Hugh P. McCormick Family Professor of Endocrinology and Metabolism and holds a joint appointment in the World Center for Prevention, Epidemiology, and Clinical Research. She's an elected member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation and the Association of American Physicians. In 2017, she was co-recipient of the Walter Reed Distinguished Achievement Award from the Medical Alumni Association and Medical Foundation, Medical School Foundation at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. Dr. Golden received her bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Maryland College Park, her doctorate of medicine from the University of Virginia School of Medicine, and her master of health science degree in clinical epidemiology from the Johns Hopkins Pullenberg School of Public Health. She completed her residency in, in, in internal medicine at the Johns Hopkins Hospital and a fellowship in endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism with the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. And that, last but not least, Dr. Saskia Popescu is an assistant professor in the biodefense program within the Shaw School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. 
She currently serves as a member of the Federation of American Scientists Coronavirus Task Force and is a member of the Committee on Data Needs uh, to monitor evolution of SARS uh, COVID-19 too within the Health and Medicine Division of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Prior to joining Mason, Popescu worked as infection prevention epidemiologist in several large healthcare systems, working to enhance readiness and bio preparedness. She also serves as an adjunct professor in the University of Arizona College of Public Health, Epidemiology, and Biostatistics program. She received a master's in public health with a focus on infectious disease epidemiology and a master's of art in international security studies from the University of Arizona, and her PhD in biodefense from the Shah School at Mason. So thank you all so much for agreeing to be part of this critical discussion. I thought it was important to take the five minutes to introduce you fully because one of the things that I have appreciated as chair of the consortium is that this is a college town. And I keep trying to convince the, Miller, the, the, the mayor and her colleagues um, that the universities in this area have incredible talent and that we should be very proud um, of that. So we're gonna jump right in. Now, one of the questions that was posed earlier that I will start with is how do we know that these vaccines are working? And what does it mean that some people are still getting the virus after receiving the vaccine? I'll start with you, Dr. Gamble, if you wanna uh, jump in on that question. Uh, what, what evidence do we have that would develop quickly? And I know people have concerns and uh, some people are reporting that they, they still are contracting COVID-19 despite having taken the vaccine. Well, there are other people on the panel who can speak to this better than I, being a historian of medicine. But what I can take your question as is why people are concerned. You know, what are some of the bases of the concerns? And, you know, a, a couple of weeks ago, I heard from a cousin I had not heard from for years. And I had to go to a, an appointment. He calls me up and he says, I have a question for you. And my answer to him was, I'm busy, I'll get back to you, but yes, you should take the vaccine. And that's why he was calling me. And he was calling me because of his concerns. And so, you know, so, so let's talk about why people are concerned. Because one of the things that I do, and President Frederick, in your, uh, in your introduction, you mentioned that I chaired the committee that got President Clinton to uh, to apologize for the syphilis study. And one of the things that I have in my Google alerts and my Google scholar is the Tuskegee syphilis study. And I, I get so many hits every day about the syphilis study. And that's because it has, it has been used as a way to say why black folks do not trust the healthcare system. I have problems with that conception. And I have problems with that conception, one, because I don't think we should be talking about distrust. I think we should be talking about trustworthiness of institutions. And the other thing is this issue about African-Americans and health systems is more, is, is more diff difficult and complex than the syphilis study. And so because of people's histories, they have concerns, they should have concerns and our job as health professionals is to try to, to address those concerns and get people to feel comfortable about taking the vaccines. And, and I appreciate that response because I think the, that perspective of that hesitancy certainly comes from there. So maybe Dr. Popescu, you can give us a bit of the science around uh, the vaccines, I think the speed. I, and I would, I'd be honest, I think um, Operation Warp Speed was probably uh, not the best name. Um, that's not going to go down in history as, as one of the best names for uh, this activity. But maybe you could you could start us on the you know this process around creating these vaccines. Why should people feel comfortable? Yeah, I mean, I think I entirely agree with you. Warp speed was not a good name. We tend to like militarizing and securitizing health, which has some negative outcomes in that. But in terms, you know, I think kind of going back to how do we know the vaccines are working? And from the public health perspective, I look at two things. The vaccines were really developed to help reduce the burden of disease in people, meaning you get really sick, you go to the hospital and severe disease in general, death, mortality. So they are very efficacious. We're seeing really impressive results coming out so far right now in terms of reducing overall hospitalizations and mortality. And the other piece though, is that 
that kind of topic that we're all starting to discuss a little bit more is infection. So they prevent disease, but do they prevent infection? Because really from the epidemiological perspective, I wanna know, is this gonna prevent transmission? Because that is one of the big hurdles we've had with SARS-CoV-2 is that 20 to 40% of cases are asymptomatic, which makes my job and everybody else's jobs in public health really hard. Because if you don't know you're sick, I'm super reliant on you to wear your mask, distance, stay home and all of those things. So right now there's been some good studies that are showing the AZ Heroes one was great where it looked at about 4,000 essential workers and found that those that were fully vaccinated had about a 90% you know, protection against infection in general, but breakthrough infections do occur. And you know, we, we know that this is gonna happen. So I think when we discuss what makes an efficacious vaccine, it's really important that people not get our hopes up of 100%. This is not gonna give us sterilizing immunity, meaning you're exposed and you never, you know, there's a total risk elimination. Polio vaccine didn't even give us that, but it gives us a really, really effective protection against infection and disease. And that's really important because that means I'm, I'm very sure that you won't get sick, but I'm also really confident that you're not going to transmit it to other people because you also become infected and just don't have symptoms. So those are really, I think the big thing is when we discuss the vaccine efficacy and what we're seeing right now, but it is gonna take more time, especially with so much attention that's around these vaccines. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen media coverage around the vaccine so much where every single breakthrough infection is being hyper analyzed and it's good, but it's also, you know, how are we really conveying that accurately to the public without inducing a lot of fear and science communication now more than ever, I personally have seen as, something we can all really focus on more. You know, with that in mind, Dr. Oles, I guess one of the concerns that we've seen in some of the questions is that African-Americans were disproportionately impacted. And one of the concerns that we've seen in, the, in one of the questions is how do we know that the vaccines are gonna work as well um, in African-Americans as they would work um, in others? Anything that you'd like to add on um, to Dr. Popescu's uh, uh, response. Sure, so um, what I can say is for the FDA to approve a phase three clinical study, um, they have to have a broad spectrum of, of the population at risk. And it, it, so the uh, 30,000 folks that participated in that phase three clinical st study are, are not um, uh, of all, uh, it is a very diverse um, population. Um, so out of uh, 15,000 folks who are in either uh, wing of the, uh, the um, randomized study, um, uh, I've seen the numbers myself and there are certainly uh, um, the requisite number of uh, African-Americans in that piece of the study for us to have confidence in the statistical power uh, of that study. Um, beyond that, we now have um, results on the efficacy of the um, vaccines with regard to the real world beyond the clinical study because millions of folks have been uh, vaccinated in the United States um, and the numbers are holding up. So um, I, I feel confident um, both in the original phase three results and now from what we're seeing um, in terms of the real world. Uh, let me go to Dr. Golan. I have a question. Um, one of the concerns, especially with young people, and we have young people throughout our campuses, one of the things that they're saying is that, listen, you guys are now messing with our DNA, our genetic code by using a messenger RNA vaccine, and you're not going to be around 25, 30 years from now when we suffer the consequences. So I'll pass, especially since young people aren't getting sick. What do you say in response to that, can, that uh, what sounds like a rational um, argument. Um, so I think that, that that's really important. And that was one of the first concerns that many people expressed. And, um, and I, you know, I must say that was an, it was an interesting thing even for me as a, a clinician and scientist to think about an mRNA vaccine. So um, I actually read to understand how is it that um, how do mRNA vaccines work? And I think one, is, one thing that's very important to think about is um, it's being called a new technology, but in fact, mRNA vaccines and the science behind that have been developed for about nine to 10 years, specifically for the purpose of being able to create a vaccine for 
a viral pandemic so we could do it quickly because normally we've got to grow things in eggs and it takes like years and years to develop that and we don't have years and years right now so um so the technology was really developed for a, such a time as this if we think about it so the technology itself is not new in that regard this is just the first time we're applying it so i think that's important to know and really in thinking about you know you know how the vaccines work um you know there's like the dna that's like the blueprint you know in our cell that that makes me me and that makes every person who they are uniquely and but then in order to really um for that person to function then from that dna there's the mrna that actually translates that and makes the proteins and so what is happening with the mrna vaccine is that it is giving us just enough mrna to cause our body to make that little spike protein. So it's called coronavirus means crown. And so it has those little spike proteins. So not to make the whole virus, but to make just that protein. And then that stimulates our body to make antibodies to the protein that RNA, mRNA gets degraded. So the next time, you know, my body sees a coronavirus, it says, oh, that's not a part of Sharita. This is foreign. So I'm going to kill it. And so, um, I must admit when I read about that technology and really understood it for myself, I thought it was brilliant and that um, I was not getting injected with an attenuated version of something, which is how some of our vaccines work. So if you think about it, most of the vaccines we have, we're getting maybe an attenuated virus or something. So in this case, we're not getting that. So it's not actually changing our blueprint. Um, it's just having us create something that gives us immune protection. Um, so, you know, as we think about long-term consequences, um, it is very hard to predict 20 years from now what might have happened. But, you know, as a clinician, from what I've seen from COVID-19, I just want to make sure I'm here in 20 years to see what that might be. And COVID itself has long-term consequences that we don't fully understand yet, right? So either way, we're sort of trying to hedge our bets about what will happen. And, um, you know, and so I, I think that hedging your bet with the vaccine is really crucial right now when so many Americans are still dying. And, and Dr. Golden, I, I really appreciate that explanation because one of the things that I think is problematic uh, today is that transparency and openness. And so that uh, shifts me to Dr. Gamble. Um, you know, one of the, I, I worry that while we mentioned the Tuskegee experiment, I'm not sure that the average American actually knows what occurred. And I don't think that we have spoken about it in an open and transparent effort enough. I, I feel like we start the conversation with let's move forward. You know, that happened, it can happen again, but we don't give the fullness of the explanation. What about today and why, why are you convinced that there are assurances that these clinical trials have been safe and that this vaccine, as Dr. Ohl said, would not come to market um, with all these safeguards, some of which came out of uh, that Tuskegee experiment? Well, first of all, I have to give a shout out to Dr. Golden for, um, for talking about the importance of a historical perspective. And when she was talking about um, the vaccines, the technology, um, because that's what I always say, that the technology occurred before, uh, before COVID-19 when I tried to do the explanation. So I want to Thank you. As, as much as I can push history, I will. So I just want to uh, thank you for that. Getting, getting back um, to, to your question, um, the thing about the, I have, I have problems with people always evoking Tuskegee. I mean, I, I, you know, my friends have told me I have been nursing the, the, the syphilis study for almost 50 years now. I did my, I did my senior thesis in uh, college on it. So, so it's a part of my development, my professional development, but I have a problem with it because I think it contributes to a certain laziness, a certain laziness in analysis. And what do I mean by that? I mean by that, that yes, for some people, it's the syphilis study that went on for 40 years that was not um, a secret study. Um, and then some people think, you know, that the men were injected with syphilis. They were not injected with syphilis. And so there's problems of misinformation about the syphilis study. But then the other thing is I've done work that showed that African-Americans had problems with trust of medical institutions before the initiation of 
the syphilis study. But then the other thing too, is I think that for many people, it's their day to day life in America that contributes to their wariness about medical institutions. Now, as you mentioned, I'm, um, you know, I always talk about that. I'm from West Philly. I always talk about West Philly, but I'm a Penn grad. I'm a proud to be a Penn grad, but at the same time, there's a tension there. There's a tension there being a member, being an African-American and my association with a medical school. For example, we might be talking about the syphilis study and uh, medical institutions, but today in Philadelphia, the conversation is not about the syphilis study, but the fact that the, the university museum kept bones from the move bombing for over 30 years. And so that that leads to attitudes. So, so, my, so my advice is to find out why people believe the way they do and don't go about stereotyping people. I, you know, I, again, I appreciate that. I, I also, I'm, I'm often hesitant to make that statement that you made so boldly that I think people invoke the Tuskegee uh, study uh, very often, but I, I think they do it out of context uh, to the point that, that you made. And I appreciate the context you just gave it. You know, Dr. Popescu, um, Dr. Oles mentioned the diversity within the trials. Um, it would be helpful if you could probably frame some numbers around that in terms of what the targets were and, and what we really achieved. And then subsequent to that, it would be great for Dr. Golden uh, to probably put it in perspective of where the country is today in terms of getting that vaccine out. Because while African-Americans are disproportionately impacted, there is a concern as to whether we're getting the vaccines to them. Yeah, so I, I would probably defer directly to the FDA reports that are released by the manufacturers, but the goal is to to make it as representative as the, as the community as possible. Now, the truth is that's inherently going to be biased, right? Who defines that? Who gets to choose what is, you know, the general demographic? So I, I personally think, you know, there was a lack of, of pregnant women in this in the trials too. So that was a big question of how safe were the vaccines and for pregnant individuals and um, even those who are HIV positive. So all of these pieces. You know, I'm, I always defer to the literature that's been published by the pharmaceutical companies and the FDA review. I don't have those memorized, I'm sorry. But, you know, I think the truth is that more and more with the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, it really emphasizes that, yes, we're going to have 30,000 participants and 15,000 are going to be placebo and 15,000 are going to actually be getting the vaccine. But we could probably do a better job at explaining what diversity means in that and how we're ensuring recruitment and it's, it, you know, and I just, you know, I, I personally think that we haven't spent enough time talking about who made up of sample sizes. And, you know, I, I'm thinking about, I can't even tell you the numbers and simply because, I mean, that's on me, but I also think, have we really discussed that overall and who's part of that trial and who gets to help make those determinations? And I, I honestly can't say that that's something I've seen widely published. So that's that's a bigger question that speaks to our need to address at a public health level. Personally. Oh, good good point, Dr. Golden. Yeah, well, I was going to add to that. So interestingly, I um I you know I know some of those numbers just because being African American, I was curious were there people in the trials that look like me? Um, and I can tell you since we couldn't have our normal large Thanksgiving dinner, um, I was baking a small ham and like read every New England Journal I could find. But, um, but but it was very intentional in the in the recruitment. So there were about ten percent in the Pfizer and Moderna trials. So for Pfizer, that was about 3,000 and all the African-Americans were recruited from the US. So these are blacks and African-Americans from the US because these are international trials. So I think that's important to point out. And then for, for the Moderna vaccine, it was about 4,000. Um, and then if we look at um, Latinos um, and um, Hispanic individuals, it was about 20% in each of the trials. And I believe in Johnson & Johnson, there were about 19% individuals were black and about a quarter um, were Hispanic and Latinx. And so, you know, because I practice in the Baltimore area, um, our patients needed to know that that particular um, 
information as we were thinking about, to Dr. Frederick's point, you know, how do we then think about making sure those populations are vaccinated? So we wanted to make sure they knew there were people there that looked like them. Um, and, so, and so I think that there were intentional efforts and then also that there were, um, that there were people with comorbidities. That's another question. About a third of the people had diabetes, hypertension, asthma, you know, a lot of the chronic diseases, because many people are concerned, I have those diseases, should I get the vaccine? Um, and the answer is yes. Um, and so I think as we think about, Dr. Frederick, your question about um, have we reached, you know, the communities that we need to, um, you know, I, we have now, I think it's something, I think the last numbers I've heard is about, you know, 40% or so of the U.S. population is vaccinated, but then we need to actually look, what does the breakdown look like by race and ethnicity? I do know that in the state of Maryland that um, we're probably third in the country for having vaccinated African-Americans. And I think that is likely because many of our health systems associated with universities have really been using our efforts to um, do mobile vaccine efforts. So we have a large mobile vaccine effort um, in the Washington DC area and as well as in um, Baltimore with Johns Hopkins Medicine because we've really got to take the vaccine to the community. Um, and I'll make one other point. I wanted to follow up on something Dr. Gamble said that I think is so critical because I believe in history also um, is it's not just Tuskegee and people have had biased experiences for a number of reasons and still do. But one thing that's interesting that um, our Baltimore County Health Commissioner said on a panel the other night is people are uncomfortable coming to our institutions to get the vaccine. But if they get COVID and get deathly ill, guess where they're going? Right to those health systems they don't trust, saying, please throw everything at me, whether it works or not, to save my life. So it's better to be on the side of the prevention um, and know that there are advocates and allies on the inside who are looking out for you than to come in the other way way. So I just want to make that point about the history. We will still run to the institutions that have violated our trust when we are ill. So we really need to partner together. I, I, I appreciate that point. And that, and that actually leads me to Dr. Ohls. There, there are several vaccines now. And there are myths that some vaccines are being, I shouldn't say myths, but there are concerns that some vaccines are being pushed to certain communities over others. Um, and there are concerns about the, the effectiveness, which is, again, I think back to one point that Dr. Popescu made earlier. I'm amazed when I see some of the statistics. I don't think we have vaccines, um, some vaccines in the past that work at that level of uh, efficacy, but now we pay so much attention uh, to these numbers without the context. So maybe you can walk us through uh, seeing that we have the different vaccines, whether or not people should be trying to take a particular vaccine or not, and why? Sorry, I think you, you're still on mute. Sorry about that. Is, is that question directed at me, Dr. Frederick? That, that question is directed at you. Yeah, so um, first I'll say that um, I, I took the uh, Pfizer messenger RNA vaccine and so did my wife. So um, uh, I, what, I, what I'm about to say is also something that I'm willing to put myself at, at risk for. Um, I look at the history of vaccines, which goes back a whole, a, a long time, way back into the 19th century. And I view them as one of the miracles of modern medicine um, because wellness is a whole lot more important um, uh, in, in terms of prevention than um, what we do in the ICU at the last minute to try and, and save lives. Um, so historically vaccines have changed the world in, in, in many ways. The reason polio is, is not a thing anymore in the United States is because of a vaccine. Um, and um, the reason I, when I was a kid and I used to travel overseas, I had a giant sm smallpox vaccination scar on, on, on my um, arm. And uh, no one has to worry about that generally anymore um, because that um, disease has been eradicated, but it had a mortality rate of 30% as opposed to COVID-19, which has a mortality rate of maybe between 0.3 and, 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 and 1%. So um, vaccines have changed the world for the better. And I'm talking about the planet as a whole, not just the United States. So um, the technology is, is 
has been around for many years and it's, um, it's, it's, it's life-giving, it's life-affirming. Um, with regard to the constellation of vaccines that are out there for COVID-19 right now, we're of course most familiar in the States with the two messenger RNA vaccines, Moderna and, and with um, Pfizer and uh, the efficacy numbers on those, I've seen the hard numbers are really impressive and significantly more impressive than what I'm used to as a biomedical person um, in my career. I'm, I'm used to getting happy around 60% efficacy. So it, it makes me feel pretty good. I, I think that we have ignored the Johnson & Johnson vaccine um, so far in this discussion. And given that it only requires one jab, I um, view it as extraordinarily important for communities that are at risk because once they've got the shot, they don't have to come back. And the data on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine to me are um, very robust also. So I view it as, um, as important in our armamentarium of, of fighting this pandemic as the two messenger RNA vaccines. And finally, I'll say that we don't solve this, this problem until we solve it globally. And when I look at the numbers for what's going on in India or what's going on in Brazil right now, I, as a scientist, understand that a virus does not respect political borders. And um, particularly, um, there are a constellation of us in science who are very worried about the aerosol nature of how COVID-19 um, spreads through, um, through the air. So, um, we can't walk away from fighting this when we vaccinated the United States. It's a global problem and so many people are suffering globally and we need all the vaccines and there are plenty out there um, and we need to share them and we need to coordinate with one another across the globe to get this done. And I, and I, I appreciate that point. I'm gonna have Dr. Gamble uh, jump in and follow up. Um, the historian, we are now creating a history. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine was paused um, based on some of that, getting it out into the community again, is very recent history, probably not well understood. And I think as Dr. Popescu said in the opening, every single one of these things get a scrutiny that's unbelievable. One in a million people may have that impact or even less one, in, and, but yet still there's some concern. What do you see, and as a follow-up to Dr. O's um, comment and looking at history, what do you see as a solution for how we communicate this uh, to the public to overcome that hesitancy? Well, what, what I was gonna say in terms of uh, Dr. O's comment, uh, I agree with him about how vaccines have changed the world. I, I just finished teaching a course on uh, epidemics in American history, and I agree about the whole thing, looking at this in a global perspective. And when you talked about the long history of vaccines, but I think what is less understood is that there is a long history of vaccine hesitancy. That even when Jenner came up with the smallpox vaccine, there were cartoons in the British press showing people turning into cows after getting the, uh, the smallpox vaccine. So that I think it's important to, to understand too that, that um, in connection with the history of vaccines, there's also been a history of vaccine hesitancy. The factors for why the, the, there's vaccine hesitancy change so that this is not, you know, whatever term you use, vaccine, you know, skepticism, vaccine, hesitancy, vaccine reluctance, that there is, there's a long history of that that we need to, to recognize. And at the same time, when we talk about vaccines, the same way as like Dr. Golden was talking about trust, we have to, we have to I think, drill down on what we're talking about. Um, for example, uh, you know, it started like black people uh, were hesitant to get the, you know, to get the vaccine. But then we started realizing it might've been an allocation problem. It was racialized. I said, yeah, it's racialized. Now we're talking about white Republican rural men not uh, getting the vaccine. So, so that, that is an issue. And the other thing, you know, I've done work about trust. And I always say, what are we talking about here? Because there's certain forms of trust. You might trust your doctor, 
who works in a particular medical institution, but you might not trust the medical institution unless you're really sick. And then you go, and so we have to figure out what are the elements of trust. But I just wanted to point out this whole long history of vaccine hesitancy. And I appreciate that. I think they go hand in hand. And it's very interesting, as you pointed out, the change in demographic of that hesitancy. So with that in mind, Dr. Popescu, and putting on your public health hat, um, if you can address uh, that issue and that change in demographic, but also what role you think uh, medical schools should be playing um, in supporting global health and really educating about global health, because we are going to need more professionals like yourself around biopreparedness, et cetera, uh, as we travel and engage, you know, so fluidly as a society. Well, for the first part, I think the vaccine vaccine hesitancy, you know, as, as Dr. Gamble noted, it's not new. What we're seeing right now, in my opinion, is also a lot of politicization of the vaccine and public health response. And that's that's, you know, as she noted, the demographics, it's it's quite representative of that. Um, I, you know, when I when I look at vaccine hesitancy, it's it's a lot of building trust with people and understanding the root cause of the issue instead of just trying to continuously argue with them. I feel like all of us have probably gotten into disputes on Facebook with family or friends, and it's just like spinning your wheels. But if we try to get to the root cause of it, I found that that's building that trust and that relationship dynamic that can hopefully address the issue. In terms of preparing medical schools and students, you know, there's a fascinating concept that disease knows no borders. And to a certain extent, yes, but that's also ignoring that some countries are inherently more equipped and prepared to respond to infectious diseases than others. Now, on the other hand, we kind of take that to the extreme. So the Global Health um, Security Index was released late 2019, I believe, and it showed the US really prepared for infectious disease threats. Now that's kind of a hubris in some ways as well, because we thought we're gonna handle COVID, it's gonna be fine. We have stockpiles and ventilators and healthcare workers, it's gonna be fine. And here we're, and I think that's the, the most telling example of infectious diseases or complex threats. And we tend to really focus on supplies and not the very complex issues that they unveil. So, you know, I keep thinking right now as we're looking at vaccines and global health security in general, we're ignoring critical facets of public health and global health. You know, the recent JAMA podcast where you had a very prestigious individual say that systemic racism doesn't exist in medicine was pretty mind blowing to me. So when we're talking about global health security, I so rarely see us talking about equity and the social dynamics that are going to severely be widened and more fractured during a pandemic. I, I can't think of a time when we really address this truly in biodefense and global health security and moving forward, it absolutely has to be an issue. And that is teaching physicians and public health practitioners about these issues and having those conversations that might be painful at first, but have to happen so that we can be effective in responding to today's threat, but also tomorrow's. So, you know, building on that, I actually suffer from sickle cell anemia. I'm homozygous uh, for sickle cell. And I, I definitely um, appreciate your point of the role that racism stereotyping can play in terms of how someone would provide healthcare. I also uh, see Howard in the community as a trusted messenger and the role that that can play in terms of bringing people uh, to do the right thing. So with that in mind, Dr. Golden, what, how do we get the trusted messengers in terms of partnering with folks in the community to get the message out and to overcome uh, some of this vaccine hesitancy? Um, that is it's just such a critical element to what we do. And I see it as a critical part of our public health messaging to Dr. Popescu's point is it can't all happen within the brick and mortar walls of our medical institutions. It, it actually needs to happen out in the community. And so one of the things that we were talking about in our COVID um, vaccine community outreach group this morning is that we had done partnerships with the Baltimore City Health Department, with our senior housing, and with our churches. And we had like, you know, two or 300 people in a mobile vaccine clinic that we would do in a few hours because, you know, their trusted messenger was their pastor or it was the Baltimore City Health Department or the community health worker affiliated. What we're realizing now is that now we have young people 
and middle age individuals and their trusted messengers are different because you know we were did a clinic yesterday where there was a much smaller number of people who signed up to be vaccinated and what we realized is we've got to identify who's the messenger for that younger group that has the young families that may or may not be affiliated with a medical establishment. So I think it's really important to do very innovative things. You know, one of the things we did at the start of the pandemic is we worked with our Baltimore City chapter of the NAACP and there was a sound truck that we helped fund. It didn't have our name on it, but it was just a partnership we did with them. And it basically said, wear your mask, stay home, and distance because this time last year, the weather got warm and everyone was hanging out on the corner, spreading COVID to one another. And, and we recognize that some of those people did not necessarily have um, a television or the Wi-Fi to be getting up-to-date information. So the sound truck, literally a bullhorn with local celebrities telling people these messages. And so we realized this morning, now we need to send the truck around to say, please get your vaccine and why. So I think it's, it's critical to partner with those messages. I feel like our role is, is um, maybe health systems is to help fund and support and provide the resources for our community to part, um, partners to be the ones on the front lines who are actually delivering the message. And so that we've been working very closely with our government and community affairs to do that because, you know, in fact, people are listening to their Iman or their your pastor. Um, I think it's also working with the community to figure out for that particular community, what is their why with the vaccine? So, you know, intellectually, I could get myself there on the technology and how it works and herd immunity and why that was important. At the end of the day, you know, my parents turned 85 during the pandemic, and I felt like I spent a year keeping them alive. And so my thing was just like, doctor, put your own oxygen mask on first, so you can then protect others. So at at the end of the day, my my real why for getting the vaccine was I don't want to take anything to them, you know. And so you got to figure out I mean, in many of our communities how can they get past that? You know, I'm, I'm not I, I, my trust has been violated by the system, or um, I'm concerned about the technology, or I'm worried about the long term effects, you know. But our community members can tell us. Well, let me tell you the why for this community that will actually motivate them. So I think that's why that community partnership is so important. I don't think that. We in the medical establishment know those answers, but the community knows those answers. I'd like Dr. Gamble to probably pick up on the issue of equity. And then I'd like to go to Dr. Popescu and Dr. Olds to talk about reducing harm. What, what are the things in place that are helping us reduce harm? So Dr. Gamble, you first mm -hmm. on the issue of equity. Yes, um, I wrote an article 11 years ago about African-Americans and the 1918 influenza epidemic. I am talking more about that article 11 years later than when it first came out. Um, it, because I'm asked about, you know, what are the parallels in the African American community between the 1918 influenza pandemic and um, uh, COVID-19? And something that Dr. Profesco said, Profesco said, and that was the whole idea about inequities. Because both pandemics have revealed inequities in American society. And, you know, if you look at it globally ar around the world. So that in 1918, it revealed racial inequities around segregation. The 1918 influenza pandemic took place when there was rigid segregation in the United States during the Jim Crow era, where places like Howard University Medical School was in the hospital were running emergency clinic in black schools because black patients could not get care in white hospitals. And so that revealed racial inequities. Um, the other thing it revealed is how the black community rallied to take care of itself at a time when other institutions did not. So today with COVID-19, we once again see how a pandemic is revealing inequities in American society around race, around socioeconomic status, uh, around healthcare. So that, you know, that's one of the things when we think about these pandemics, it's not just a public health issue, it's a much broader societal issue. No, and, and your point is well taken. And I think that rallying has to be a part of that. And so Dr. Popescu, maybe you can comment on, on reduction 
uh, in harm. I, I think it's a it's an important um, issue. Uh, while there there are positive things about um, the vaccine, they're getting vaccinated. Um, you know, what what are your thoughts about uh, the reduction of harm? Well, harm reduction, I think, has been one of the biggest lessons for this pandemic, honestly, how we communicate risk and that shame doesn't work. You know, if we look at what we learned from the HIV pandemic is really telling how we, if you go to an emergency department right now and there's concern for sexually transmitted infection, the question is, did you have unsafe sex? That is an inherently biased, loaded question instead of saying, did you have condomless sex? And we learned so much that that is still prevalent, but when right now, when we're looking at explaining harm reduction and risk, we're asking people, well, did you go out? Were you wearing a mask? What were you doing? And it's very accusatory. And I think so much of our communication when it comes to risk, whether it's with a vaccine or communicating what increases or decreases it, has to really take into consideration how that's being perceived, how that messaging is being verbalized. Because it's really easy for me to say, we'll go get a vaccine or you need to improve your ventilation. But that's a really privileged stance to take. You know, that's assuming you have access to a vaccine, you have transportation to a vaccine, or can take a day off if you don't feel well, but that you have the means and the resources as a small business owner to go get enhanced ventilation and filtration. So I, I'm continuously seeing a challenge with harm reduction in our communication because we're shaming people for going to the beach, or you know, we're shaming them for not wearing a mask when they're you know, walking in a dog park with their dog. And it's it's really disruptive and it goes against the goals of public health. So more and more, I keep thinking about how our science communication and our risk communication needs to be improved to be reflective of what we're projecting on people and the shame or distrust that that's fueling. So I'm, I'm going to push the envelope a little bit and I'm going to start with you, but I want everyone on the panel to comment on this. Um, I'm chair of the, the board of the consortium. And obviously one of the things we're discussing is mandating the vaccines. And uh, does that actually uh, push people into a difficult position, um, if not of shame, but of accepting uh, vaccines that are all approved under emergency use authorization? Um, you know, obviously, and, and I'm not asking you to necessarily comment on each of your university's policies, just to be clear, I wanna keep you immune from your uh, from your presidents uh, who've already made decisions. But I, this is, I think, a very important point. I have not made such a decision yet um, because I am concerned that the community that I have um, has a mistrust of the medical community. And I am a bit worried that if I uh, mandate um, a vaccine, any vaccine that's under emergency use authorization, am I uh, ignoring that concern. So I'll start with you, Dr. Popescu, but I'd like each of you to comment on your thoughts about that and maybe um, how we could communicate that better because of the public health interest. Dr. Frederick, before we do that, could I ask you a question? Oh, because, sure. <laughs> because, because I'm, I'm curious, because you are a decision maker with that. It was very sure. interesting to hear your perspective yeah, uh, about, sure. you know, in terms of your community. Um, and so for you, how are you gauging that in terms of your, I, I'm just very curious. No, absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll put myself out there. Um, <laughs> I want my entire community to get the vaccine. Let me be clear. I got the vaccine. Um, everybody in my family who's my 16 year old son has gotten the vaccine. My wife has, I have a 14 year old daughter who has asthma and, um, you know, we have also protected her. My wife also got it to protect me. As I said, I have sickle cell and type one diabetes. I still operate, I'll be operating tomorrow morning. I'm in the hospital almost every day. So I certainly put, um, have significant risk. So I want my entire community to be vaccinated, but I want to do that through education. Um, anytime I speak to people about the vaccine, I try to educate them about it. I never say to anyone at the end of that conversation, you need to go get the vaccine. What I say to them is any question you have about it, I'll answer it. Any, any of my employees will tell you that I also say to all the employees, staff organization, uh, the faculty, et cetera, if you have any family member who wants to discuss the vaccine, um, I'm happy to do that on any day of the week. And they've taken me up on it. And I've gotten on the phone with people who said to me everything from Tuskegee to it was too quick. And I've had conversations with them. 
And at the end, they say to me, which vaccine should you take? I said, discuss that with your physician. What I'm here to do is to answer any question that you may have. So that's how I'm looking at it with my community. Now, it, it, it's, a, it's a tough question because everything from living in residence halls, there are some parents who want their students to only be in the residence halls if everybody in the residence hall has a vaccine. But as I said to people, if you only vaccinate the students, the faculty and staff are at risk. And so it, you have to really vaccinate the entire community. And if you're gonna have a mandate, it has to be for everyone. And don't get me wrong, um, just as much as I'm here on the hot seat, I probably on Tuesday will be sending out the communication saying that everybody needs to get it, has to be mandated to get it. But my point is just, I, 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 am a, I don't feel that we've had enough conversation about the complexity of it. And I am one that believes in that dialogue, education, transparency, and getting some dialogue before um, you know, a full decision is made, especially in my community. So you, you put me on the hot seat, Dr. Gamble, and I'm sure Facebook, uh, my Facebook messages will blow up after this. So I'll start with Dr. Popescu, go to Dr. Oles, Dr. Golden, and I, I'll let you get the last word of this issue, Dr. Gamble. <laughs> You know, it's a tough one. I, I look at how we approach it in healthcare and with the flu vaccine, right? And the approach is everybody's got to get it. And if you don't get it, you're going to have to wear a mask all season. And we still struggle getting people vaccinated. You know, that that approach often, it doesn't always work. I, I, I mirror your sentiments that I would rather educate and address it that way, simply because this is an EUA. I mean, they will likely get fully approved. But if Outside of hospitals and academic institutions, are we going to then be normalizing vaccine mandates and will that trickle into other businesses or in situations that are gonna impact employment or housing? So this it's it's a bigger question that I, I just kind of struggle with. And I also think, what if the student can't get vaccinated? And you know, what if they have legitimate concerns about it? And we're gonna be forcing that, is that a, a hurdle to their education or their housing? How does that work? So, you know, I, I'm I'm torn, I guess. I have kind of an ambiguous answer because I just I find it very complex. And you know, I'm vaccinated, my my family's vaccinated. I like you will always take the time to answer questions about it. But you know, we do require meningitis vaccines and in campuses, so that's already kind of normalized, but that's a a very, um, I, I hate to use the term accepted, but it's a vaccine we've had for a while people feel quite comfortable with. So if we are automatically requiring them right now where there's still a lot of stress and anxiety and politicization around the vaccine, that I think might just kind of compound the issue a bit. I, I appreciate that comment. And you can, you can join me in the uh, club of um, ambiguity. Um, however, as Dr. Gabriel pointed out, I am a decision maker and I would say it's more, I'm, I'm having an internal dialogue. I'm, I'm speaking to my entire community, getting feedback and I will make a decision next week, but I, I feel the conversation was important. Dr. Oles and then go to Dr. Golden. What are your thoughts? Should we um, mandate? And if we do, how, how do we also enforce? I, I am very glad that I have left the ranks of the decision makers when I left the Obama administration. And um, I, I don't envy your, your position in, a, in a, a subject matter that's so fraught with, with um, politiza politicization and, and, uh, and ambiguity. So, um, so I'll simply say that I read in the Chronicle of Higher Education today that uh, there are at least 100 um, institutions out there across the United States that are mandating vaccines, including our sister institution in College Park, I believe. And, um, and I think um, that is reflective of, of, of um, at least one side of the argument. The, I would say the straight public health side of the argument. Um, the argument that goes back to the days when for me to be able to travel outside the United States, I had to have a separate passport inside my US passport, um, full stop. So um, that's one side of the argument. And then uh, the other side of the argument has to do with obviously all of the issues that we've been talking about today. And um, I don't think 
the book has been written that definitively answers all of those. So I'll just leave it there. Yeah, I, I, and again, I appreciate I appreciate your comments, uh, Dr. Golden. So I, you know, I think um, as as thinking about this, I um, we have a vaccine task force, you know, across Johns Hopkins Medicine that has multiple stakeholders on it, and I think as we've been thinking about this is. Um, you know, we have a very a large diverse workforce. And then so some of our workforce, is, so um, I can appreciate your comments, Dr. Frederick, because, you know, a large part of our workforce live in the communities around our campuses in Baltimore, for example. And so we are sensitive to the fact that there is a historical context that we need to be mindful of in any decision around mandating the vaccines. And I think one of the things that we have talked about recently is whatever we decide to do, we just do not want to worsen or reinforce any inequities. So in other words, you know, having differences, you know, in the workplace about what people can and cannot do if they're vaccinated, for example, would create or reinforce some inequities that may already exist. And so, you know, in my role as a chief diversity officer, who's also a clinician, you know, we need to be safe from a public health standpoint, but we also don't want to create a situation where people feel othered yet again. Right, and so I think that that is why sort of similar to, to you all, I've been exhausting myself, like anyone I can talk to, answer a questions, point them in the right direction, tell my own personal vaccine story. Our whole family, my husband's also a physician, we're vaccinated, our son just got vaccinated. Um, parents on both sides in the 80s are vaccinated, but, but I think that we really need to make sure that we're not reinforcing inequity in whatever mandatory decision that we make. And I think we also it needs to also not be top down. So, you know, really getting um, the executive leadership that has to make these decisions, getting input from the stakeholders um, who are like on the ground level. And so that I think that's been an important part of these conversations. And I think we need to have patience as well um, to allow that education and that filtering into the communities to, to take place. Because we found the more we've talked, the more buy-in we've gotten from people. So I think my biggest thing in thinking about this is making sure we don't create new inequities or reinforce old ones with any type of mandate that we, we decide. And I, and I think you bring up a good point. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, one of the things that, that was clear, housing insecurity was, is an example. If we mandate that everybody in the residence halls is, uh, has to be vaccinated, and there are students who are hesitant uh, for one reason or the other, we may worsen their housing insecurity as an example. And so th that is my sensitivity. And, and again, um, you probably just got a flavor of what our consortium meetings are like as we uh, try to discuss these things. And I think uh, I, I take Dr. Ohl's, uh comment uh, to heart. You know, as a decision maker, it's very different. I know I knew the decision I needed to make and, and within my household, but I also have to make sure that that does not in overly influence my decision elsewhere. So I think it's it's really um, important for us to look at that as well. So with that in mind, um, Dr. Gamble. Uh, I was waiting for the clock to run out here. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking at the time. <laughs> is hoping that it, you know it it, it would it would run out. Um, I mean, this is one of those for myself. I have, you know, as you were talking about internal dialogue with myself and some days, you know, you know, I'll say one thing and I'll, you know, other days I'll think another thing. But I, I think the important thing here, I mean, is I, you know, you know, most days I believe that, you know, there should be mandates, but at the same time to, to underscore what um, Dr. Golden talked about talks about, I don't want to um, increase inequities. I also don't want to chase people away in terms of the conversation or to feel that they, they can't get an education uh, if they don't get uh, the, uh, um, the, the vaccine. So I mean, I think the words that, you know, I was writing down the words that people were using like complexity, ambiguity, internal dialogue. It's, it's, all there, but at the same time, I would like to underscore something that Dr. Golden talked about, and that is not top down and also to have communications, to talk with as many 
people as possible. And they might not be the usual people we think we seem to talk about, talk with when we make, uh, come up with decisions. So best of luck to you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate it. And that takes us right to the bottom of the hour. First, let me thank all of you. Uh, like I said, one of my arguments is that this is a college town. Uh, I really believe if you look at per capita in terms of students per capita, et cetera, uh, this Washington regional metropolitan area uh, has a lot to offer. And I think you saw it on display here today for all of our audience. I want to thank all of you for your invaluable insight um, as well. And when I put out my thoughts about uh, the mandate, I hopefully will get to quote all of you, if not blame all of you for my position that I finally came to. Most importantly, we want everyone to remain safe and, and to stay um, healthy. And that's what this is about, um, us trying to educate. And so I, I thank uh, uh, everyone who participated today, both the audience and uh, the panelists. So thanks very much for your time and please stay safe and stay healthy. <laughs>